Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 25, titled Revealing Your Rainbow Body. Okay, can, can I say one thing? Yes, please. Uh, Gyushi, four tantras. Why is it four tantras? It could be four sutra, you know, because they're texts, right? And Buddhists always have sutra. Now, there is one lama, the Taratuku. I don't you probably never met him. He was know, called Taratuku. Yes, yes. Uh, from, he was the abbot of Buddha Monastery. He passed away in the 80s. He has a reincarnation who now in Debo mm-hmm. and Losaling. And he once answered a question. Somebody said, what is Tantra? And he, it's the best answer I ever heard somebody say what the word, what Tantra is. Which literally, Gela said rightly, Tantra means lineage or continuation in that sense. It's sort of the root meaning of the word Tantra. But what, what he said was, He said, well, you know, in the basic practice of Buddhism, the whole purpose is to destroy the world built out of ignorance, the world of suffering. So what wisdom does is it sees through being trapped. Trapped? I'm making a joke. Trapped. (laughs) It's escape from being trapped in the world of ignorance. But then when you escape from the world of ignorance and you're trapped, and you're no longer trapped and you're free, then there's the question of rebuilding a world with wisdom. And a world made of wisdom, like a rainbow world, a wisdom world, rebuilding that world. And that's what Tantra means. So the the real meaning of continuum, or lineage, or continuation is continuing the world, now a beautiful world, a world built out of wisdom, which means the realization of connection, love and compassion. Love and compassion is not just a sentiment. It comes out of wisdom of knowing that you're connected to other persons. And, and so, so therefore the four tantras are what Buddha, Buddha is continuing after enlightenment. And this is a very challenging thing for us in the West, where we are taught that the world doesn't work out The world sucks, actually. We're all depressed because we are taught that the world sucks. In the the religious people in the old days, it sucked, but later you'll be okay in heaven, you know, if you're a good boy, you know. And Jesus or Buddha or or Muhammad or Moses or God will take you in heaven. But this world is just going to suck. That's it. There's no other way out of it. And uh, in India, they also have that idea. And Buddha was rebelled against that idea because he saw... That the world, actually, the reality of the world is fine. It's perfect. It's freedom, it's connection, it's the interconnection of everyone, it's happiness. Nirvana means happiness. He saw that that's the reality of the world. He called it Dharma. The word Dharma before Buddha meant something like law, religion, something that holds you in a pattern holds you, like traps you in a pattern where you can bear to live, or something like that. But Buddha said Dharma means reality holds you in freedom from suffering. He flipped the meaning into the opposite meaning, where it holds you in freedom. So reality holds you in freedom. So the whole, the reason that the medical teaching is so effective is that it's born of Buddha's enlightenment. In the root tantra, Buddha, in a different parts of the Buddha's mind, different wisdoms are talking to himself. He asks himself questions, he teaches about the body, the mind, etc., etc., all this kind of thing. So in, in an empowerment, entering the Tantra of empowerment means connecting to a vision of the world of someone who understands it as perfectly okay. Live or die, up or down, it'll be okay. You know, coma or awake or sleep, it'll be okay ultimately. It, you, you can make it not okay by fighting with everything and by feeling frightened and being all kind of like it's all won't work and how can I get out of here and all this kind of thing. But if you 
take refuge in dharma, meaning reality itself, on the assurance of the teacher who taught that reality is fine if you open yourself to it. And the community of people who've been living like that, like you talk, like Iganla, like people like that. So then there's a continuation. You then enter the kind of connection to that continuation. And that's what Tantra means. It doesn't mean this or that or something secret necessarily. It, in the ancient time, or sometimes it was kept a little bit secret because the people who want to keep people trapped in a version of life where they are expected to be miserable. And therefore, if they're going to get out of that misery, they need these authorities, they need these bosses. They have to obey these bosses. So they don't like someone saying, it's fine, whatever. You know, without you, boss, it's okay. So they don't like that. They don't want people to feel that the reality is freedom rather than the reality is being bossed around by them. So they kept it secret from that kind of people because then they, otherwise they would punish someone who, who was too happy. As you all know, in America, yeah. for example, if you're really happy, it's something illegal. Yeah. <laughs> right? We, we are programmed like that. If you know, your roommate comes home, your wife, your husband, your friend, your son even comes home and says, Dad, I'm just so happy, no reason at all, but I'm just completely happy. Is Dad happy? No, Dad is worried. What happened? <laughs> Did you drink? Did you take a drug? Are you freaked out? Are you having a psychotic episode? <laughs> What's wrong with you? That's what we think. Yeah. So the, for that, it was sort of a little bit secret. You know, Tantra has this tendency of hearing about esoteric, you know, secret. Because it just goes against the grain of, the, of our backward world, where we're, you know, where, we're think, where we're taught to expect to be miserable. And therefore... We feel safe when we are, and if we ever feel really happy, we think something's going to go wrong, and then we get nervous, you know, we're programmed like that. So this you talk, Ying Tik, the heart drop or heart essence or heart teaching of the, the great turquoise roof, rainbow body guy, is really a wonderful privilege, and therefore I bug Genla. Genla was not promoting himself to do this, but I requested him very earnestly to do this, even if I'm not ready quite, and I don't, uh, I am not prepared well enough, and maybe I shouldn't do even. But it's just to connect to this tradition and to connect Menla, what Menla represents as an effort in the world, this polluted world, to try to like bring people back to nature, as you put it, you know. And, and remember, they say nature red in tooth and claw, like get away. That's why they were all getting away from nature because nature is so dangerous and horrible, right? <laughs> Meanwhile. We have like a jungle in our stomachs, <laughs> and, if, and if it's not functioning lushly, that jungle of our microbiome, we're going to be really in trouble, you know. We depend upon the nature in our gut, right? The billions of, of, of genes and animals in our gut. So, so that's the thing. And it's, imagine if anybody claimed today, you went down to Mount Sinai Hospital or Beth Israel Hospital or the National Institute of Health, whatever you say, oh, somebody fully understood everything about how the body and mind works, life and death and rebirth. and hope. It's totally understood. It's a matter of just learning about it, and it'll, it'll work fine. What would they do? They would give you some chemical to calm you down because you'd be considered demented. And they, they thrive on the idea that nobody will ever find out. So, but that they can learn a little more and therefore give them a big grant and then sent them off to do some research, even though the principle is that they'll never find out what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And then, actually, to show that it's really important what they're doing, they sacrifice animals. Mm -hmm. Like, just like an ancient priest, you know, has an animal sacrifice, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't sacrifice, they're sacrificing up a storm of animals. Uh -huh. And to show that it's really important, they can take life, you know. Uh -huh. That really shows how sad it is, you know. Frankly, I think. I'm a peta. I like peta. They try to stop them from doing all of that sort of thing. They don't, you know, they don't really... The human being is... It's, it's already understood. You don't have to do that. You just, just eat some good food. Just laugh. Breathe. Have your shoulder blades like an eagle wings, like Genla says. Breathe. And then, and then if, you, if you're going to get... If you get in a coma, know how to do POA, and then do soul ejection. Press the ejection seat. 
boom, you go up, and you caught by Amitabha. The, Chi the Chinese have wonderful paintings of the Pure Land, and uh, the Pure Land, I mean, well, the, the particular one that's very famous in Buddhism, the Western paradise called Sukhavati, the blissful land. Sukha means, the spa over here is called Mahasukha, great bliss spa. Sukha means bliss. And uh, Sukhavati, you know, possessing bliss. Where Amitabha, the Buddha of boundless life, is dwelling, or Amitabha's boundless life. But he has two big bodhisattvas, one big strong one and one compassionate one, Avalokiteshvara. And they have these great paintings, and Avalokiteshvara has in his hand, big hand, he has a lotus. But he's like Yogi Berra. He's like a catcher in a baseball game. And then they show paintings of streams of souls, of beings that have died on earth. And, and Avalokiteshvara is like a catcher of mitt, and he's going to catch them on the lotus. You know, he's, he's going to catch that soul and then put it in the pure land, right? So catching you, you know, like that. Really sweet. They have this in these caves in uh, China, everywhere. And, uh, and the Chinese Confucian ministers in ancient time, they wrote a memorial to the emperors. And they said, you know, Mr. Emperor, Your Majesty, this pure land Buddhist view of Asukabati, of the universe under the power of compassion, is very dangerous. When those farmers, they go and they see in the cave painting the beautiful palace of Amitabha, and his beautiful golden body with rainbow light rays, and all the lotuses, everybody sitting on lotuses in these pure lands. When they come back out and they go downtown and, and they're to the market and they look at your palace, it'll look like a rat check. <laughs> and they're not going to work for you all day and feel dedicated and devoted to you. So you better keep those Buddhists out of here, telling, them that, telling everybody that life is all right and there's this blissful blissful world emperor of life, you know, of the, in, the infinite life. You know. They really tried to warn, warn those emperors, don't let them in here. Because it's just two cut rainbow bodies. Every peasant can have a rainbow body. They're not going to bend over and plant rice all day long in your field, your majesty. So that's, we're still in that sort of situation. So this is, we're very lucky and marvelous to have Gela here and to receive, even though we might not fully be ready to understand and be able to do everything, to get a connection to the tradition growing out of the vision of the wondrousness and beauty of nature and life against our pre preconception that it's a mess. Right? Is that okay, Gela? Yes. Is that all right? And the mambo sonrana. What? Come on, you should do. Oh, come on, you should do? So you want me to say a little more? Okay. So, so uh, but anyway, so, that, so that's the word for tantra, you know. So it's sort of, you, you could say tantra can mean technological continuum based on wisdom. And then, you know, Gela mentioned that this empowerment thing is page 81, which is very good, because what it is, is it, for example, there are the five poisons, not just three, but although two of them are kind of combinations. So you have ignorance, delusion or confusion, you know, you have desire, lust and, and attachment and greed, and you have anger and hatred, and then you have pride and you have jealousy which are kind of connected with the different ones, you know. Sort of a mixture like desire and anger, or jealousy is sort of a mixture of desire and anger. And pride is ignorance, you know, kind of a pride of ordinariness. That's like, I'm so great, even my ordinary self is great, even without being enlightened, kind of that kind of wrong pride. Now, those, are, however, are energies in the world. And they're sort of bad, right? They're supposed to be bad. In the regular Buddhism... The big, when you get started, you think of them as traps, and you learn to re release yourself from them. You replace ignorance with wisdom. You replace desire with detachment. You replace anger with, with um, love, you re or tolerance, and then love. You replace pride with humility. You re replace jealousy with also love, and so on. And, and you try to sort of subdue them so they don't drive you. But then, when you get sort of calm about them, and then you get connected to this idea of that reality is all good, you know, samantapadra, they call it, all universally good, you then take those energies and you turn them into wisdoms. So ignorance becomes mirror wisdom. That's something very, very beautiful and brilliant. For example, you know, 
when I see the floor, the floor seems to me to have intrinsic objectivity. It's like a thing in itself out there, right? And I, my perception of it seems to me to be sort of an absolutely correct thing. The word floor, my concept of floor, sort of goes and bounces off the absolute substantiality of the floor. And, uh, and I'm completely different from the floor and not connected to it. In a way, well, when I walk on it, I am. But, but it's something totally different from me, right? Subject, object. Both are kind of absolute difference, right? That's it. Then that's, that's what ignorance is. Because actually, the floor... You know, and even in scientists will tell you it looks like a solid floor, but it's actually molecules, atoms. The atom itself is mostly emptiness. There's a nucleus in there and electrons spinning around. Then if you throw, the, if you throw one of the boards here into one of those electron accelerators, it will dissolve and completely disappear. And, and, and Although some people in France will jump up and down and say they found a Higgs boson. And the Higgs boson is why the thing is solid. They'll try to pretend that. But then, then the Prometheans say, well, we don't really know, and we've got to do some more research, so give us another 20 billion to make a bigger electron thing, and then maybe we'll find dark energy and dark matter, which we can't see and we don't know where it is, but it's 97% of the universe. So, so our ignorance sees it in this, as if it was absolutely just a floor, and my subject, I'm a person who's completely different from a floor. But... The fact that I see it, even seeing it wrongly, and I feel about myself like I'm an absolute thing of my mind that's apart from it, wrongly, that mirrors to me my connection to it. Because I'm seeing it, and even mistaking it for its true nature, not seeing it in relativity. So even our ignorant perception of the self and of the world mirrors our ultimate interconnectedness to it, if you follow me. And that's called mirror wisdom. And in a way, the world is in a state of mirror wisdom, I think. Because, you know, people thought nature was just out there and they could abuse it and throw crap in it and misuse it and you know, mine it and pollute it and do everything. And what's happening now is, you know, the power of the technology of the human cleverness magnified in this way is such that nature is like rebelling and a human being is becoming responsible for shaping nature which is a complete startling idea that just happened to people en masse. Buddha knew that, but, uh, but, and, the, and you talk, knew that, but now en masse people are learning that, that you know, what you put in comes out, you're connected to it, it you are nature, so you can't destroy it, or you know, you'll destroy yourself. So that's mirroring the reality of interconnection, actually. And, uh, for example, the Pope, in his Laudato Si, his recent encyclical about the environment, He's going on and on about interconnection. Mm -hmm. Whereas Christian theology is well known mm -hmm. that ultimately, you know, God is separate, absolute, you know, apart from everything and, and you know, makes it, can makes it out of nothing and the universe is nothing except God and all this kind of thing. So there's actually a big disconnection in the theology usually, but he's totally broken out of that, which is what's so amazing about him actually. So ignorance becomes, ignorance itself mirrors wisdom. So it becomes called the mirror-like wisdom. Then desire, uh, you know, or lust, becomes discriminating wisdom. Or the Lama Gavindi used to translate it nicely, I think, as individuating wisdom. So it's a ruby color. You know, the mirror wisdom is a white diamond type color. And the ruby color is this, like, desire becomes like a red ruby energy. And it becomes, and it's, it's, it's seeing the beauty of things and seeing them in their specific specificity, you know, discriminating between this and that and the other. And that becomes, desire becomes that, or individuating wisdom. And anger, well, I'll that last. Then pride becomes uh, topaz golden color, and it becomes the wisdom of equality. And jealousy, this is a really good one, which is green, like the green-eyed monster. There's an interesting, you know, in the West they call it green-eyed monster when you're jealous. So jealousy is a green color, and then that becomes all-accomplishing wisdom. Because jealousy is where you feel separate from another person's happiness, so you resent their happiness, and you feel, why isn't it my happiness? Right? Right? When your friend comes home and they're really happy for no reason, 
and you're really worried what happened to them and what did they do and is something going wrong with them and this and that. And finally, if they convince you that it's perfectly all right, they just naturally just do feel happy for no particular reason. It's welling up out of their hearts. Then the last thing that we feel ordinarily is, well, what about me? Why don't I feel like that? Which is a kind of jealousy, you know, begrudging of something. And, and, but, but when you overcome that, anything is possible then you're really living interconnectedness. Other beings' happiness is your happiness. People can really work together. Minds can connect and do things together, and therefore there's nothing... You, miracles can happen. So that's called the all-accomplishing or the wonder-working wisdom. And the final one is hatred, anger. And anger is like destructive, you know, wants to just destroy things. But anger actually is connected to bile in the liver. It's also connected to intelligence, Critical intelligence wants to analyze things, take them apart to find out how they work and how they tick. So it's connected with critical, analytical intelligence and what, and therefore anger about the world of entrapment and the world of insufficiency and the world of misery of self and other looks to see why is it like that and analyzes everything and when it does, everything dissolves under critical analysis. If you deeply analyze whatever it is down to the molecule and the subatomic energy and the wave particle thing, you know, the quantum people have reached there finally. Buddha reached there in his mind thousands of years ago. And what happens is you come up with ultimate reality perfection wisdom. Because everything you analyze disappears, and then, but then the disappearance disappears. Because that's not a thing apart from you, a disappearance. You can't just disappear, disappear into disappearance. So when disappearance disappears, you're there as everything. It's, it is everything, you know. Nothing, void, freedom, does not impede the existence of all kind of interrelated things. But when you have seen it disappear in a way where it's not, it's not substantially like it seemed to be as if everything is totally different from everything else, you then have a feeling of oneness with all of it within, again, seeing some sort of differentiation. But now it's a new way of seeing that differentiation where everything is perfect. So the idea of ultimate reality, perfection, wisdom is almost, that's the most, the highest and most powerful wisdom. So in unexcelled yoga tantra, an uttara yoga tantra, unexcelled yoga tantra, unsurpassable yoga tantra, the blue, deep blue energy of the, of the seeing through everything and the perfection of everything is actually, which is the color of Medicine Buddha, that is the color, sapphire color, is the color of the, of the um, anger transmuted into ultimate reality perfection. A anger, hatred. You know. So then, even all seemingly, previously seemingly negative things seem totally positive. And that, of course, is a weird thing, just to talk about what is the Buddha state. You know, and this is really important, and the Tibetans particularly kept us alive, the, what's called non-dualism from, from the great masters of India. You know, the Dalai Lama likes to say, he's not a member of this or that Tibetan sect. He is the heir of the 17 great masters or pundits of, of Nalanda University, the great monastic university in India. There were many of them, but the most famous one was Nalanda. People came from all over the world to attend it. his classes and teachings. And he always says that, and that is this, what I'm trying to say is this. A lot of mystical and spiritual things people project from their sense of separate self. You know, the idea that there's an absolute self in there that's apart from all of this and it's a real problem why I'm here involved in this. So a lot of these sort of mystic states and mystic self-obliterations, even the dualistic form of Buddhism, is still a kind of self-centered thing where it's all one. It's what I call the cheap oneness. It's all one, and it all disappeared into the one, and I'm all alone, and I'm everything, but actually I'm not even here, so nobody's here. We're, it's all one. It's easy to be one because there's nobody here. So it's a great space, and I'm not there, and neither are you, so we don't have to worry about a thing. It's like this escapist idea of almost like an ultimate psychotic experience, actually, disappearing as if, you, as if that was a state, separate from having previously been there as a, as a relational being. But then the, the Tibetans 
their intelligence is so great, their understanding of the of Buddha's teaching is so fantastic, that obviously that state of what's called space-like equipoised samadhi, where everything seems to disappear, ultimate reality perfection is that all like unpleasant things disappear, but then the last thing to disappear is the dis state of disappearance. When the state of disappearance disappears, what's left? Everything. But now, you're, it's both all the same different bunch of things, and you're one with the whole thing. It's all you. So imagine what a weird state that must be. But that's very important. When Buddha attains blissful freedom, he must perceive all other beings as indivisible from that blissful freedom. Or he would be abandoning them, if you follow me, which would break his vow as a bodhisattva, I won't attain nirvana until all beings are free of suffering. So believe it or not, Buddha 2,500 years ago saw everyone in the world, including us in the future, because they see all space and time is completely permeated by this oneness. It's not just a spatial oneness, it's a temporal oneness as well, this realization. And so Shakyamuni Buddha is right here with us, and Shakyamuni Buddha sees us as made out of that bliss, just a form, an individuated, discriminating wisdom perceived form in a sea of bliss. And then the complexity comes where he's also aware that we still don't see ourselves like that. So then, and he's frustrated. Buddha is like a frustrated mother who can't just hug the child into feeling okay. Because the child, if you give that child a big hug, it will get all mad, you know. If you go, try to, if you go hug a paranoid, paranoiac, They'll think you're trying to smother them, and they'll resist even more and get more freaked out. The only way is by teaching them, by getting them, or in some way teaching, or making a joke, or opening the door for them, or whatever it is, in whatever form it is, getting them to open their own mind and heart to their own reality. Because only you can understand your own reality. No one else can understand it for you. They can give you all reasons, teachings, experiences, hints, could teach you to breathe, give you nutmeg to sleep and, uh, and chili to wake up. <laughs> but you have to do it yourself. So then that's the compassion, universal compassion. That's why that wisdom becomes a compassion. So the enlightenment is this complex state of ultimate reality perfection and yet the discriminating ruby wisdom, the rainbow ruby wisdom, of seeing how the other being is like managed to take themselves as a bunch of mental, physical, verbal bliss and turn themselves into a theater of dissatisfaction. A theater of feeling isolated and alienated and separated and not, being, not feeling they're part of it. They are just a drop in an ocean of bliss. And then that compassion then makes the Buddha teach and actually, there's a very extravagant thing that, that the Buddhists have, which makes them, which is really strange, where they say that when you feel like that, when you have that realization, you can be many beings simultaneously. You can be, I love the Matrix. Did you see the Matrix movie? Did you all see all of them, or you got tired of all the shooting, which is very adolescent, which is in it. But if you saw all of them, it's worth seeing, nevertheless, in spite of all that silly shooting. Because... Later on, right, he multiplies himself in many bodies, right? The Matrix guy does, because he knows how the structure of it works at the same time as he's an individual being in it. He also, then he can be many. Then even the bad guy learns that, right? And then the two of them are multiply struggling with each other. And how does he defeat the bad guy? The one thing the bad guy can't do is the bad guy can't be him, whereas he can be the bad guy. So when the bad guy puts his fist in his chest, to make the Neo into another reflection of himself. Instead, he turns into Neo. He becomes a better guy. I can't explain it, but it was brilliant. I love the Wachowski brothers. Are bodhisattvas. They're totally great. So, oh, it's next brother and sister now, actually. One of them is a sister. She had a sex change. Oh, the Wachowski okay. brothers, now there's one as a sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> Her name is Lana. So, so that's, that's this, this thing where all, even anything bad becomes good. 
is transmuted by wisdom into goodness. So everything is good. You know? And that, on that basis, that, that, that is done, that wisdom doesn't, is the same actually as the compassion for others still feeling that it's bad. It doesn't abandon them into saying, well, I see you as cool, if you don't, tough luck. Which some, there are some sort of mystical, not so-called non-dualisms that are like that. But this, this is not like that. I see you as perfectly good and I'm with you until you, you come into seeing it yourself. Completely with you all the time. And that's what Kala Chakra is. When Buddha, Buddha's manifestation as Kala Chakra who is called time wheel. But wheel means machine like we say about a car, you know, nice wheels, you know, that means your machine. So time machine, but not a machine going around in time like time was a, a, an abstract medium. But time itself becomes a machine meaning an evolutionary machine. And the Buddha shapes your evolutionary destiny so you can reach your own understanding in the optimal, best possible way. Is what it symbolizes, Kala Chakra. It symbolizes Buddha's vow to never abandon other beings in suffering, but to stay with them all the time. So anyway, but that's a big shock to us. You know, It is a big shock, the idea that A, the, someone does fully understand the world, life, death, absolute relative, whatever it is, that they taught us how to do it and that we can understand it ourselves. And then on top of that, we have to. We cannot graduate into, into our own reality of bliss unless we understand it. And we can't, believing in it is helpful, can be at some stage helpful, but even it can be turned wrong, just mere belief with no reason. Finally, you have to experience and understand it. And, uh, uh, and you won't experience it without understanding it. So every, and everyone can. And if we don't have time in this life, we can do it in another life. Once we connect to the stream leading there. In a way, leading there means leading here. Because you know? we're already here, actually. <laughs> but, but when we feel we're not, then we have to go somewhere. We feel like we're going somewhere else. Okay. I talked for 20 more minutes, almost. <laughs> <laughs> Any question? It's amazing, isn't it, that there could be such a being? It's like I call enlightenment the state of the ultimate cognitive dissonance, tolerance, tolerance of cognitive dissonance, where you're sort of, everything is bliss, and yet you're specifically and minutely aware of every single little bit that others are still suffering totally aware of that and completely compassionately committed to turning it to bliss in the only way you can which is to help them do it because you can't force them to do that and you know there's one thing where it's evidence even in Theravada Buddhism who they don't like this they go oh come on no nirvana's out there we're leaving Buddha left here's having para nirvana behind me that means final nirvana they translate pari as final which is a mistranslation pari doesn't mean final it means total doesn't mean final pari there are the words for final in Sanskrit, but it's not pari. Pari means total. And they say, that's pari nirvana. He left town. There's no Buddha around. Like, we just have to do our best. That's what Theravada people will tell you. So they don't necessarily get this. But, um, but on the other hand, when they, sort of, when they do disappear, they have the disappearing experience, then unfortunately they reappear. Because anything that is a new understanding... You go to a different place, that's only a relational experience. That cannot be the absolute. The absolute is just realizing where you've always been. There can be no change about it. it and so we have to have always been there if, if it's here, you know. And it's here. But there was something else I wanted to say about it, but I lost track of it. <laughs> I fell off into the something. There was something else I wanted to say about it, which was good, but we'll have to wait. <laughs> So it, comes, it finds me again. <laughs> Questions? Oh yeah, it's, no, it's just on a simple level. <laughs> it's on a simple level that we, you know, that, that in that case, we can then feel a kind of confidence and it, less, it can lessen our anxiety. And in a way, it's a kind of refuge that somehow reality is filled with the good. And, you know, Voltaire, remember, he ridiculed in his book, Candide, you know, the, the, the Christians, the theistic attempt to sort of reassure people that ultimately God will take care of it and they'll be all right if they behave themselves. 
Of course, there's that silly thing about eternal damnation, which is just completely senseless. And, uh, and the Buddha would consider the idea that a loving God would, would save eternal damnation for anybody to be a really rude idea about God. You know, if he's omnipotent and he's loving, like, how can anybody, even the worst person, cannot possibly suffer eternally? That's ridiculous. Totally stupid. You know? It's a, it's a horrible model for bad policing and a nasty justice system with too many people in jail. It's really bad. And, uh, but, but for us, it's a shock, the idea that we really we could be all right. It takes away a certain excuse. Then it's only up to us to learn more about ourselves and the world. Even little by little. Oh yeah, and I was going to say, oh I know, in the Theravada, yes. When Buddha was under the tree, everybody knows the story. Before attaining enlightenment, it's in every version. Before he realizes nirvana, which they call the freedom from contamination, final freedom from contamination, he remembers infinite previous lives of himself. He remembers his beginningless previous lives. And then he becomes aware of all other beings' infinite previous lives. So he has those two realizations, his own and others. And then he attains nirvana. Now what's so fascinating about that is, why don't we remember all our infinite previous lives? We experience them. But why don't you remember how you felt when you burned yourself in the kitchen, when you broke your ankle, when you, because it's just painful, you don't want to remember it. So the fact that he developed the ability to remember infinite lives and deaths means that he realized he'd always been in nirvana and all of it was a play of bliss. So he revised his memory so that he wasn't in agony even when he was in hell. Because even the hell was his own stupidity of contorting himself into some sense of isolation and alienation and separation in some extreme manner. But the whole time, he was never apart from nirvana. And when he can realize, when he knows that, then he fearlessly remembers without, there's no, because there's, in a way, he, that counteracts the pain. He realizes he was in pain then, but he's no longer in pain now when he remembers it. Right? And then he's able to see all other beings pain that same way. So in a way, those two realizations, although they don't put it like that in Theravada, because they're not emphasizing universal compassion, you know, Mahakarana, Ningje Chimbo. But actually, if you remembered infinite previous lives and everybody else's infinite previous lives, we've been going at it, baby, infinite numbers of times. You've been my mom, I've been your mom, we've been, we've been enemies too, you know. So we're completely entangled. We have been from beginninglessly and we remain completely entangled. So that's a precursor to realizing Buddha's realization that he is every being. He, she, it, whatever, whatever it is. It's, it is every being. Do you follow me? That's what that is. So that shows precisely that this nirvana is not a separation of any kind. It is an, it is an expansion to embrace everything. Like you identify with your child at, when it's at the breast, you know. When it first comes out, you feel it is you, you know. Of course, I guess when it's in there, unless it kicks too much, you identify with it. Then when you're in love, you identify with the beloved. People in a team can identify with the whole team. Or buddies in war identify with the people in the platoon. So that human ability shows how close we are to Buddhahood, where we can identify completely and feel we are the other. Even in a family, you're in the kitchen and somebody's chopping onions and you're like washing something and then they cut themselves. They go, and everybody in the whole room goes, ah, like that. Even though only one person actually had the nerve hit, you know. And so the Buddha is like, like, feels like that of all beings. It's able to because he sees all of that, even the seemingly painful thing, as a bliss. He feels it at the same time as a bliss. At the same time, he's aware they don't feel it that way, so his compassion enfolds them as best he can to lead them toward where they become also free of that. Without leaving the world. Without abandoning anybody. So therefore keeping his bodhisattva, the bodhisattva vow, right? The bodhisattva vow is I will not seek a separate peace for myself. We will all find it together type of thing, right? But then some people take time. Like you can't take a, a, a flower seed, put it in the ground, soil, fertilize everything, then just take the top of the seed and pull it into a rose bush. 
you destroy the seed. You know? So things have a, their own organic like patterns of growth and evolutionary development, but you can sure have, you can speed it up with like high tech teaching. You can. <laughs>